Welcome, church family, and those joining us on Zoom, and I believe YouTube also. Welcome. Our first selection is hymn number 524, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. We'll be back just a few pages, 518, Standing on the Promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Run. 
545 will be our final selection. Savior like a shepherd. Savior like a shepherd. Good morning. morning. Welcome to each and every one this morning. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord and hear our music and our singing and praise and give glory to him. We have several announcements today, so the ladies behind us are going to make a couple. They'll stand out more if you see a new face and a different face, and you'll remember what they said better than what I said. Today, I want to draw attention to Bob Sanjale has our children's story at the appropriate time. Lancelot and Dr. Daniel King have our special music this morning, and Bethany Grant has a special presentation on her mission trip. So at the appropriate time, they will be coming forward and telling you about those. A week from tomorrow is what? Camp meeting starts. We'll be live streaming that next Sabbath from this location. Pastor will probably say a little bit more about that. Also, if you're a visitor here today, we've provided lunch for you in the fellowship hall next door. We would love it if you would stay by and spend time with us, that we could be better acquainted. All right, Deb, I'm going to let you go first. Tell us about the school year. And then Julie's going to tell us about VBS. Hello, I'm not a new face, I'm a very old face here. So um, I just want to bring to you our heartfelt thank you from the school board, from the school. This year was a difficult year, but with your support, your prayers, your physical support, cleaning the school, you know, everything else, leading out in worships, and your dedication to helping with tuitions and we brought a need to you from for money that was met abundantly god blessed god bless each one of you and just a couple of notes 
At graduation, we had 148 people here in this building. We had six kindergartners graduating into first grade. And we had two eighth graders graduating out. Your prayers have been wonderful. Your support has been great. And four school-aged children have been baptized this year. So um, thank you very much. God bless you all. Well, this clearly is a church that recognizes the importance of education for our children, Christian education. We want to continue that during the summer. We have Vacation Bible School coming up. Yes, a year has gone by. We had a lot of fun last year. And so um, Vacation Bible School will be uh, June 12th through the 16th from 5.30 to 8 o'clock at night. And um, this is for all children ages 6 to 12. And we do have a program planned for the kids under age 6 as well for the parents to bring. It's gonna be a fun time. We're going to be learning about how Jesus is so faithful to us and that when we are faithful to him, he does wonderful things in our life. So we'll be learning about Jonah and Noah and Moses and Peter walking on the water and how he called his disciples and they followed in faith. And we are all of his disciples, and so we want to keep that ever-present in the minds of our children. So please join us. If you can help out, we'd appreciate it, either by prayers, finance, or support, and actually coming and being there. We will need some teen helpers, so please see me if you're interested. I'll need to know ahead of time. Thank you very much. Well, the pandemic is behind us in the rearview mirror, Amen. and it's time for us to be about our Father's business. Amen. We're going to share the three angels' message with the community around us, and this year we're going to share it with a brand new community we haven't worked in before, Greer. And you are invited to come and be a part of that class. Take your brochure and see all the information about it, and we want you to make your reservation as well as any friends that you talk to, ask them to call and make their reservation and we'll enjoy a wonderful class together. Thank you. You may now breathe easy. Nobody will call you and ask you to serve in some position. I will read through the names as a first reading for our nominating committee's uh, directions. And next week, we will have them printed and available for you to take as we take a final vote. All right. Listen up carefully. I'm going real fast. <clears throat> I'll take a deep breath. Head Elder, Alberto Alvarez. Elders, John Bryant, Robert Carney, Jeremy Ford, George Kim, Charles Milton. Deacon, be a co-head deacons with Jeff Harms and Don Grant. Assistant deacons are Bob Rayburn and Art Slater. Other deacons, Dan Agnetta, Will Alford, Mark Balvin, Dick Bailey, George Cantrell, Ronnie Davenport, Sean Ekman, Daniel King, Lancelot King, Lenoy Kaiser, Wally McDaniel, Steve Milks, Michael Owens, Michael Owens, and Michael Wolf. Uh, junior deacons, uh, Judah Kim, Lim Milks, Benjamin Owens, Ethan Owens, Grayson Rowe, and Jonathan Wolf. Deaconess, co deaconesses as head, Pixie Paradis and Kelly Edney. Assistant Doria Harms. Deaconesses to follow Nancy Agneta, Charlene Alford, Yahara Alvarez, Debbie Balvin, Sonia Bennett, Regina Bryant, Donna Cantrell, Barbara Carney, Christy Derby, Kim Ekman, Myrna Esch, MJ Foster, Jamie Grinley, Tanya Kim, Sharice Milton, Julie Rayburn, Paula Slater, Melissa Ziachi. Junior Deaconess, Hannah Bush, Amy Ford, Emily Ford, Nivia Hodge, Alexa Kim, Olivia Owens, Casey Perez, Leah Rowe, Juliana Wolf, and Victoria Wolf. Church clerk, Bev Cook, assisted by Deb Grant. Statistics being held by Howard Britton. Church secretary, Marty Logue. Treasurer, Debbie Owens, assisted by Janice Sanjale. Uh, counters for the treasury, Tim Grinley, Donna Cantrell, Myrna Ash, Michael Meadows, Lynn Bailey, Bob Sanjale, Pixie Paradis, Regina Bryant, Linda Michael, and Roger Feeden. 
Communications director is our church secretary, Marty Logue. Our sign coordinator out front, the marquee, Bob Sanjale. Website coordinator, Michael Kwan. Facebook director, Sarah Wolf. Newsletter uh, editors, Lorna Deaver and Dick Bailey. Music ministry team, headed by Jamie Grinley with assistants Roger Peden. Others on that committee would be Dick and Lynn Bailey, Becky Oliver, Leah Rowe, Milka Perez, and Sharice Milton. Children's story leader, Becky Oliver. The greeters, chaired by Kelly Edney, Debbie Balvin, Mark Balvin, Don Grant, Richard Hodge, Ronnie Hartwell, Juan Agua Hartwell, and Carol Peden. Uh, landscape team, Will Offord and Julie Rayburn. Our church decorations, headed by Kim Ekman, Ramona Grant, and Megan Reynolds. Community service team, director is Bev Cook. Our thrift store manager is Sarah Wolf, and assistant manager, John Bryant. Chair of our bread manager, Lorna Deaver, and assistant manager, Wanagua Hartwell. Women's ministry director, Kelly Edney, uh, assisted by Charlene Offord and Ramona Grant. Men's ministry is Robert Carney and Charles Milton. Personal ministries, Nancy Franks and MJ Foster. Generous living, or the benevolence team, uh, directed by Wally McDaniel, we have Jeff Harms, Pixie Paradis, Debbie Owens, Kim Ekman, Becky Oliver, and Carol Peden. Health ministry led by D Bev Cook. Religious liberty leaders, Mark Balvin. Adventurers, Megan Reynolds, director, Don B. Kwan, um, helping out. Pathfinders, we have no director. If you have that burden, let me know. We do have an assistant, Steve Milks, and other helpers, Sarah Wolf and Milka Riccio. Uh, prayer ministries led by Lorna Deaver. Disability min ministries by Terry Robinson. Superintendent of Sabbath School, head Bob Sanjale, being assisted by George Cantrell, Bev Cook, Kelly Edney, and Doria Harms. Adult Sabbath School teachers are decided by the uh, Sabbath School Council and not chosen by the church at large. Secretary, Secre Secretary of Sabbath School, Deb Grant, uh, Youth and Young Adult Division, Leader Art Slater, uh, assisted by Kim Ekman and Tanya Kim. Junior Division Leader is Wanago Hartwell, Michael Meadows, and Milka Perez. Prison Primary Division Leader, Michael and Sarah Wolf, Debbie Ford, and Terry Robinson. Uh, kindergarten Leader, Nancy Franks, Connie Davenport, John Janice Sanjale, uh, Lynn Bailey, and Deb Grant. The Beginners is Sarah Rowe, Yara Alvarez, and Dombi Kwam. Uh, vacation of Bible School for next year would be Melissa Ziachi. School board chairs, Deb Grant, home and school leader, Megan Reynolds, school treasurer, Michael Meadows. School board members are those listed above, as well as the pastor, and Tim Grinley, Dick Bailey, Marty Logue, and Hannah Rowe. Scholarship committee is made up of the school treasurer, the church treasurer, the school board chair, and a pastor. Our Mount Pisgah Academy representative is Sarah Wolf. Audiovisual committee, chaired by Wes and Lila Peterson, and also serving there as Marty and Wendy Logue. Art Slater, Dan Agnetta, and Michael Kwan. Duplicating is controlled by Howard Britton. Building and planning committee head, Bob Sanjale, serving with him, Alberta Alvarez, Ramona Grant, Roger Peden, and Bob Rayburn. Evangelism committee is the pastor, Jeff Harms, Pixie Paradis, Bev Cook, uh, Alberto Alvarez, Terry Bantz, Charles Milton, and Harry Robinson. Safety committee, uh, Jeff Harms and the Deacons. Uh, disaster relief committee is headed by Lorna Deaver, our librarian in Wanagua Hartwell. Finance committee is a lot of different of people who have already jobs are listed. The pastor, the treasurer, the school treasurer, the head elder, head deacon, head deaconess, uh, generous living, uh, thrift store manager, and share their bed manager. Social committee head, Sarah and Michael Wolf, uh, MJ Foster, Sharice and Charles Milton, and Paula and Art Slater. Um, fellowship dinner team, is coordinated by Wendy Logue. Our members are Alberto and Jahira Alvarez, Renee and Bud Atkins, Sonia Bennett, Regina and John Bryant, Barbara and Robert Carney, Connie and Robert Ronnie Davenport, Debbie and Jeremy Ford, Wendy and Marty Logue, Carla Powell, Julie and Bob Rayburn, Janice and Bob Sanjale, Paula and Art Slater, Sarah and Michael Wolf. Board members are assigned by um, positions. I will post this on the bulletin board after church if you want to look at it more carefully, that's fine. Next week, I will have printed copies for those of you to have in hand, and we will also take a vote. Thank you. <laughs> Relative to camp meeting, um, it will include 
It begins next Sunday, a week from tomorrow, and goes through the Sabbath. So the next Sabbath, most of you won't be here. So we're not going to have lunch here for June 3, I believe it is. All right? Sabbath, June 3. We will not have a lunch here. There will be lunch at camp meeting. For those that you want to participate, you're welcome to come to the pastor's house that he has up there. He only lives there one week out of the year, but it's really, really nice. Um, it'll be a haystack luncheon, and so that means you don't have to fix everything, but so that not everybody brings chopped tomatoes. It makes a good haystack, but it's sort of bland on this. So call Ramona, and she will coordinate on how much of individuals are bringing what and where and how. So she might ask you to bring a head of lettuce or a bag of chips or um, whatever, different things that fit into it. All those onions, you name it, it can go in there. Let me keep going. Avocados, and <laughs> salsa. Anyway, anyway, so if you'll contact Ramona uh, by Thursday, so she has a general idea of how many is coming, as well as to get an idea of what item that you may be able to participate in and enjoy our fellowship together as our church. The house itself is located overlooking the lake. Got a great big front porch. Um, it's the first house, actually, as you come from the main auditorium back towards the entry. Uh, there's a, the, the motel, and there's a museum, and then it's the next house. Um, it's called the Avet House. I don't remember the number. Yes? 527. 527 Lakeshore Drive. North Lakeshore. North Lakeshore Drive. Anyway, so you're welcome to come there for lunch and join us together. Thank you. A few more? Time for our call to worship. Actually, it's past time for call to worship. Um, I invite you to bow or kneel as we sing together. Our Father, we are thankful for the blessings of another Sabbath day. The opportunity you give us to come together, to fellowship with you, to fellowship with one another, to learn, to study, to grow, and worship, and praise you. As we gather together this morning, may your spirit rest upon each and every one, that we can experience this time with you in such a special way. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand for opening song, Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart, hymn 27. Oh 
Good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. Be quiet and dwell on who's really in charge. Some of us thought we were in charge this week. Huh? Did I hear that? When you heard the list read this morning, you realize all the volunteers and what it takes for church to function. I want to thank each and every one from our musicians to those who volunteer in each position. It's what makes this church unique. 160 to 180 people fellowship and worship here this week, each week, including Zoom. There are 10 or 12 in the balcony this morning. If you're visiting here, we welcome you again, and there is always room for new members. Pastor reminded me as we were up here, there's one way to become a member here. Just ask. We'd love to have you. It's time for the children's part of our fellowship and worship this morning. If children, if you would take up our worthy student offering, and Bob Sanjale will have our story as you come forward. Good morning. It's nice to see your bright, shining faces this morning. <clears throat> the story, it's not really a story this morning, but the talk I'm going to give is really an old one that's been around for a long time, but I have not, I don't remember it ever being done here since my wife and I have been coming to this church. So hopefully this generation of young people maybe haven't seen it for a long time. But it's been around the church for forever, I think. It's really talking about the subject of words and how powerful they are. So to start out this morning, we're going to have a little race, you might say. But it's not a running race. It's a whole different kind of race. And it requires a little bit of setup. And the first thing we need is something to put on the floor because we don't want to get any blood on the carpet, do we? Does anybody want to go back to their seats after hearing that? No, there's going to be no blood. But it is, it, this is to protect the carpet. The next part of this race is two styrofoam plates for our two contestants.
Should I ask for volunteers before I tell you the part of the race? We should have a boy and a girl just for fun. Everybody's pointing. No him, no him, no her. You, you had your hand up already, so you can come up as a girl. Come on, we need a boy. I'm going to have to call another girl if somebody doesn't pop up. <laughs> Charles volunteered Logan. There you go. Okay. So the last part of our race, why don't you get over on this side, Logan, is what you will need to race with. And that is, of course, a tube of toothpaste. What? <laughs> no, no. Okay, the object of this race is when I say go, you're going to unscrew the top and see how fast you can empty the entire tube onto that plate. Ready, set, go. Make sure it's all empty, all from the bottom. I don't know how to make this interesting. It's, it's coming out. That's pretty, that's pretty empty. Yours is pretty empty too, I think. There's nothing, hardly anything coming out. Okay, that was pretty fast. That was pretty fast for both of you. Now, did I tell you this was a two-part race? The second part of the race is we're gonna see how fast you can get it back in the tube. You think that's going to be tough? All right, okay. I anticipated you might complain, so I brought you each a tool. That should make it much easier, right? Ready, set, go. I didn't try this at home, so I'm counting on you guys. Don't get it, don't get it on you. Make sure it drips over the It's not nearly as easy, is it? I'm I'm hoping you uh, <laughs> Pastor's Pastor's worried about his sermon time here, so is it, is it safe to say that it was a lot harder trying to put it back in than taking it out? And it's pretty much, you would never get it all back in there. It would take a long, long time. <laughs> okay, so you can, you can put your implements down. I also have wet wipes here. So you can, kinda cl so you can clean your hands if you got any on your hands. You did. Oh, you can lick it if you want to. I guess it's not going to hurt. And you're, you're okay with you're not spilled? Okay. All right. So what does this have to do with words? <clears throat> words are powerful. Certainly words are important to us because we communicate by means of words. And a lot of words are printed. And you have to learn words in school so you can read and write. But I'm talking more this morning about words that come out of your mouth. Words can come out of our mouth very, very easily, just like that toothpaste came out very easily when you squeezed. But once words come out of your mouth, you can't put them back in. It's a one-way street. As soon as you say something, those words are out there. And the effect that they have on other people can be bad or it can be good. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody says something to you or maybe does something to you and your first reaction was, boy, that makes me mad. So I'm going to say something mean to show them how I feel. 
And too often, that's what happens. We say things very quickly based on how we feel at that moment. And especially, it comes out fast when somebody has hurt us with their words or made us feel bad in some way. It's easy to just lash out and come out with some remark that is not very kind. And can anybody think of a time with all the words that Jesus spoke while he lived on earth and all the words that we find of his in the Bible, did he ever react badly to anybody and make somebody feel bad? I can't think of a single time. The Bible has some really good advice about words that come out of our mouth. And it's found in the book of James, I believe. It says, be swift to hear and slow to speak. So what do you think that means, be swift to hear? We know what it means to be slow to speak. That means give yourself some time to think about what you're going to say. But what does it mean to be swift to hear? That just means that's the first thing you need to do. You need to listen, not only to what the other person is saying, but listen to what God is maybe whispering in your ear after somebody says something to you. And don't let those words just fly out of your mouth because you'll never get them back. I can remember growing up when somebody said something mean to me, and my first reaction was, you know, you take that back. You ever heard somebody say that? You can't do it. The words are out there. So we need to be very careful how we speak to our friends, to our teachers, to our parents, to anybody that we meet. And regardless of what they have said or done, and regardless of how you may feel, maybe you are feeling bad or feeling hurt because they've said something mean, listen to that little voice saying, okay, I need to be slow to speak here because there's always something better than being mean in return to someone who said something. Yes. Uh, I don't think so. No toothpaste lollipops. Okay, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, help us to be swift to hear and slow to speak, remembering that words are very powerful and they can work for good or they can work to hurt people, and we don't want to do that. We want to follow your example and just help us to remember that as we continue our days. We ask in your name, amen. Thank you. Yes. Time for our morning offering, if our deacons will come forward. As I woke this morning, slightly after daylight, the hummingbird was already at the feeder, the dining room window, and the cardinals were feeding in the backyard. I opened the window and tossed out a couple of hands full of seed. By the time we came to church, there were six squirrels there. I didn't toss out any this week. I waited till Sabbath. They get a treat. Think about what God's done for you this week and return offerings based on those blessings. Our Father, we thank you this morning that you poured out heaven's best gift, Jesus, that we could have life eternal. This morning we return to you our tithes and offerings and thank you for sustaining us and for blessing us. In Christ's name, amen.
This week, as a group of ministers met on Zoom, a question was asked. Scripture says prayer and supplication. So the question came to the pastors, what's the difference in prayer and supplication? It's two different words, two different tubes of toothpaste. Well, they were the same toothpaste. Prayer is talking with the Lord, praising Him, giving Him thanks, inquiring, giving petitions. Supplication is praying with all your heart that God will hear and answer. There is a difference. This morning, you may have burdens on your heart that you would like to supplicate before the Lord this morning. If so, I'd invite you to come up for our prayer time to kneel here together. If you aren't making your way here, I would like you to turn to look at the person closest to you that is not of your family. I mean, I know you pray for your family, but don't you pray for somebody else today? Look at somebody around you, close to you, and during our prayers, pray for them. Our world needs prayer. Our nation needs prayer. Our counties need prayer, those that we come from different counties. Our church needs prayer. The individual to whom you've just looked at needs prayer. This morning we need to come together in prayer. Thank you. Our most loving Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the opportunity we have to come to you, to address you, to know that you're always there and always listening. And this morning as we lift up our hearts, open our hearts, we allow you to come in, to see, to hear, to understand, to know the things that are going on and to help us to understand them better as well. And so we pause just to talk for you. We thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayers for the nation, our prayers for our neighbor, our prayers for our family. May your power minister to each need in a mighty way, because we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on up. It's good to have three girls visiting this weekend. I'm sure the pastor's house is joyous. Bethany, welcome home. Thank you. (laughs) Tell us what the mission life is like in another country, how it impacted you, and what you were there to do for us. Yes, I shall. All right. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. So today I have the privilege of sharing with you guys the amazing experience that I had in Lebanon over spring break. Um, it's such a beautiful country there. Um, and I went with the religion department at Andrews University. 
So first I want to thank everyone here for all the prayers and donations that allowed me to go and three other people. Um, we were really worried about where we were going to find the funds, especially the leader who's planning the trip. And um, you guys made it possible for us to go, which was really, really special. Um, so first I'm going to go to the next. So um, each um, step of the mission trip, it was really evident that God wanted us to go there. Um, the leader of the trip, who's in the suit, um, in the picture there, um, he had been taking students to Lebanon for the past 20 years, but they hadn't been able to go for the past three years because of COVID. He actually um, spent a lot of his uh, childhood in Lebanon, so he was really familiar with the people uh, in the country there. Um, so the main purpose of our trip was to conduct a Middle East University's week of spiritual emphasis, which is kind of like a week of prayer. Um, so in this picture there, this is a group of students that were able to go. There's one student missing from the picture, um, but it was four girls, four guys. Um, it was kind of hard to get everyone together because of different um, issues, but we managed to get this, this small team together to go. Um, and actually, a couple of the students had went to Middle East University, so they were familiar with the campus, and then they had transferred to Andrews. Um, so the friendship team, the name came because Dr. Russell wanted it to be um, us to make friends there, to build connections, not just a short-term connection, but a lasting connection with the people there. Um, so when I first heard about this trip, um, I knew that I wanted to go. Um, I wasn't sure in what capacity. I was planning on, you know, maybe singing or doing scripture reading, doing the kind of more behind the scenes uh, work there. Um, but then I realized that I would actually have to give a sermon. And I was, I was like, okay, maybe I really won't have to. But as it got closer, I was like, okay, I'm definitely giving a sermon. Thankfully, I did have a partner, though. Um, so that made it a little bit better. Um, so I'm going to show you the next picture, and this is of the campus there. Um, it's located in Beirut, uh, Lebanon. Um, they have a relatively small school. I think it's about 200 university students, um, international, so there's a lot of different uh, students from different countries there. Um, we were staying in the girls' dormitory, um, and there are kind of guest rooms there. Um, the people at the university and just in the community in uh, Beirut, some of the most generous people I've ever met. Um, the country is currently dealing with a lot of political and financial turmoil, but the people are still um, giving you food um, even though they might not have another meal. So the people there were extremely friendly and welcoming there. Okay, so the next picture is from the top of the dormitory is kind of the rooftop, and this is just looking out. So you can see how many, just how many buildings there are, and then you have the water there. So it's beautiful there. Like every morning when we <clears throat> would walk down outside, I was just like amazed that um, people get to see this kind of view every day. So we, some of us arrived Friday, some Sabbath, and some Sunday, one Sunday actually. So we came at different times. Um, <clears throat> But this was the, the first Sunday there. Um, and I also want to mention that another miracle that kind of happened that I know some of you were praying for was the passport situation. Um, I had to get mine renewed along with another girl. And my passport ended up coming the day before we had to leave. So that was, that was a really big miracle because I was very stressed. And it was actually supposed to come the day we were leaving. Um, so I was really worried. But then I saw that it had shipped and it was going to be there the day before. So that was a miracle. Um, the other girl that had her passport um, actually had to book a flight, and she came on Sunday. Um, so that was just amazing, and I could have, could have asked for anything more. Um, so this was our first day on Sunday, our excursion day. So you see the little uh, bus thing we were in. So um, Dr. Russell knows a family there. He's known them for a long time, and every year that he goes, they take people out on an excursion day. So um, this was our first Sunday, and then we were all in that little bus. Um, and then the picture in the middle is um, Dr. Russell has known this man since he was a, a child, and he still works at the same little shop. So he wanted to stop in and get some food. So that was really special for him. Um, so the main site we were seeing on Sunday was in Baalbek. Um, it's a city, but this specific is like ancient Roman ruins, which was amazing to see all the architecture there and how much of it has been uncovered and is still intact. It was really beautiful there. Um, 
so this is another picture of Baalbek and then a group photo of us. Um, this was really special and we weren't even sure we were going to be able to do this, so it was amazing that we were actually able to see the sites. Um, so the main purpose, like I said, was to conduct MEU's um, Week of Spiritual Emphasis. So um, what went into this was planning a theme. I think Dr. Russell and the school came up with a theme, and then we were each given topics. So I had a partner, and we were going to present on Wednesday. Um, so it was all around paradoxes of identity, and we presented on, um, we kind of used the story of the uh, tax collector, uh, the Pharisee and the publican, and we uh, had a topic that was on external religion versus internal spirituality, and I was really worried about the topic, but after we had, you know, I just went up there and I uh, spoke, me and her spoke, and, you know, suddenly all my nerves were calmed and it went a lot better than I thought it could have. I wouldn't say I'm ready to become a pastor or anything, but it was definitely a little easier than I thought. <laughs> so um, this is kind of, I don't know if it can play. I don't know if the video can play, but it's us. This is um, kind of the how the day would go. We would wake up probably like 5, 5.30 every morning, and then we would walk down from Middle East University down the hill to our the first uh, stop of the day, which was a, a school called Bushria. It's an Adventist school through elementary through like eighth grade, I believe. Yes, um, and um, the this was what we did. We had two different um, talks there, one for the younger kids and one for the older kids. Um, so this is some of the pictures. We would go up on the platform and we would do music. We would do a scripture reading. Some just to be interactive with the kids, and then we would also have our topic of the day. So this is just one of the days um, Marco was talking. Um, and then this is a picture of just one of the uh, children that went to school there. And then this is another picture. And then outside they had, the kids were having recess, so we got to go over there and like talk and play with the kids. So that was really, really special. Um, so we did speak three times a day because we had two there and then we went back up the hill to Middle East University um, and in between there, then we had breakfast. So this is at um, Middle East University. So we would come back up the hill, I think it was around 11, 10, 30, 11, where we would speak there. Um, that's Dr. Russell right there, he did the night meetings. Um, and this is just all of us standing up on the stage uh, towards the end of the week there. So we just had to cater our topics just a little bit for each age group. So that was a bit of a challenge because you'd have it kind of written for MEU, but then you'd have to kind of change it a little bit so the children could understand it better. So that was definitely a challenge and really good practice, I think. Um, so there's me doing the scripture reading. And then the other picture is me and my partner doing our sermon on Wednesday. So um, throughout the week, we'd have different... Um, like small trips we take out to different places after we had done the morning meetings and at the meeting at MEU and lunch. So on Tuesday, I believe, we went to a school in downtown Beirut called Musaipi School. Um, this school's also an Adventist school. The Boucheria School and Musaipi are ran by two, the Shufani brothers, who Dr. Russell has known for a long time. Um, they're the, the principals at both of the schools. Um, so I think that's really cool, the connection they have between the schools. Um, so here, we didn't actually do a complete program. What we did is we went to the different classrooms and visited all the children there. And it was really cool because it was around Mother's Day. So they were like uh, showing us what they had made for Mother's Day and singing us songs. So that was really cool. Um, so we stayed there for quite a bit, but we were just mostly interacting with all the children there. And then they, of course, brought us a lot of food and we had a really good meal there too. So this is just us outside kind of interacting with the kids during some of their breaks. Um, they have a lot of uh, children there that go to the school, but it's a relatively small space. But as you can see, it's really, they decorate it really nice. And I think it's, I think it's some of the most colorful school I've ever seen. Like I feel like learning there is really exciting. See, this is one of the, like for the younger kids. And then one of the girls took a picture with two of the students there. So uh, then on, this was our last kind of trip out into Beirut. This was on Thursday, I believe, and this is a Syrian learning center. 
So there's a lot of Syrian refugees that are in Lebanon right now. Um, so a lot of them um, don't have a certain place to go, so they come here for schooling. Um, it's, it's really special. The people there, uh, you can tell how hard they work to make the children there have something positive to look forward to because they're dealing with extremely uh, tough times right now. Um, but the people, the children at Syrian Learning Center were some of the happiest children that I've ever seen. And it just makes me think that sometimes we're so ungrateful here going to our schools, but they were just so happy um, and very positive and excited to see us. So here we just did a little program kind of out on their roof and sang some songs with them and just interacted with them. Um, and all the children there were really excited and wanted to like get our Instagrams and stay connected with us. So then, of course, I can't not mention the food because the food was really, really good. Um, this first picture, um, we, were, we went out to eat. Um, the family that had been taking us around hadn't been out to eat in over three years, so Dr. Russell really wanted them to have like a nice meal. So we all went out to eat there, and then this is the middle picture. It's kind of like a potluck thing that we had on Sabbath. And then this picture is um, one day after we had went to Boucheria, and then they had food for us. So some of the food, like the last picture, some za'atar, and then their bread, and then some vegetables. It was really, really good. Um, some more so falafel, and some more of the za'atar, and lebe, which is kind of like a yogurt thing. And then this cake, one of the men at the church, I thought maybe they had just went to the store and bought this for us, but he actually took his time and made this cake for us and decorate it really nice for us. And I just thought that was super special because I know that he didn't have a lot of money and uh, things to provide food, but he wanted to make us this cake for everyone. Um, so these are just some more of the pictures of Lebanon. This is, we went out uh, down the downtown Beirut and we were handing out flowers and stuff for Mother's Day and balloons. And so these kind of like rock in the water um, we got to see, which I was just blown away by how pretty that was. Um, and then these are just some more of the downtown and us walking down the hill. So seeing this every day was extremely special. I feel like it would be so, it would just be so amazing to wake up every day to see this. Um, I know the country is dealing with so much political and financial uh, turmoil, but this, the beautiful nature they have, I think, is something that they really hold on to. Um, so, like I, um, some of you know, um, four of us, me and three other people, went through Turkey while everyone else went through Paris. Um, my friend Esfir's family um, are currently missionaries in uh, Turkey. Uh, her dad's a pastor. Um, so, we stopped in Turkey on our way there and back. On the way there, um, we were only there for a little bit, but on the way back, we had a full day. So, Esfir's mom, um, extremely sweet, she cooked us all of this food to have while we were there. Um, her family is extremely, extremely nice. And then um, this picture is us on, we were on the ferry crossing back over to near where her house was. Um, Turkey is another beautiful country. Um, it's, it was in Istanbul. Um, this is a picture of us with her family. Um, we got to explore the city for a day. We were very sleep deprived, but it was ex extremely fun to just be able to see all of that. Um, and then I have one last video that I want to show. Okay, well, the video, <laughs> it's, it's, I can explain what was happening. So um, while I was there, I was pulled aside by their head librarian, I believe, and he asked me what the name of the church I went to was and who the pastor was there, and I was just like, okay. And then I was sitting in the audience, and then he went up onto the stage, and he was expressing how grateful he was um, for our church um, and how even though um, we, most of us had never been to Lebanon and didn't really know uh, what the, really what the country was, he was just so grateful 
um, for such a supportive church here in the States. So he presented this book. Um, and if I could have Wenong would come up, since she is our church librarian. Um, so the man is uh, uh, Mr. Farid Kuhari, and he is their librarian there at the university. And I'm just going to read what the book says. He said, on behalf of Middle East University, I present this book as a token of appreciation for the honored Tryon North Carolina SDA church members and Pastor Robert Grant for their help and support for the friendship team visit to Lebanon 2023. So I thought this was just extremely sweet. Um, this book is um, The Roots of Christianity in Lebanon. So I think this is a really special book because there's such a rich history of Christianity in Lebanon. Um, as I learned more and more about as I was in this country. So, to add to our collection of library. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you for listening, and I hope uh, you learned a little bit more about Lebanon. Um, and I want to thank you guys again just for allowing me and so many others to go on this amazing trip. Thank you. Thank you very much. you would stand with me as we read God's words found in the book of 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in faith, knowing that some sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Thank you. May God add his blessing to the reading of the word. Amen. Our father and son team now will bring us our special music. Well, Lancelot's near here, not here, but we'll call my guitar Lancelot for today. All right. <laughs> Back in 2001, I was able to go on a mission trip to El Salvador with the Central California Conference. As shortly after they had had uh, a terrible earthquake there and kind of like devastated the country. Anyway, so I was there and of course in a Spanish-speaking country like El Salvador, you don't find too many people who know English. So uh, when I was there, we had a, um, almost like a revelation seminar type of, uh, and the play, church that we were in was just absolutely packed. So they asked me, because I brought a guitar along, will you sing a special music? I'm not sure. So I'm, I played this song. Uh, this song is called, actually the title of it is I Could Sing of Your Love Forever. But when I started to learn how to play the song, I didn't like the word could. So I changed it to will. Right? I could do it, or I will do it. I like the for sure aspect to it. So I asked my translator, I said, I'm going to sing the song, but in the chorus, I want the congregation to sing along with me. So far, I have not found a church yet who could sing louder than that church who didn't know English. So the, the uh, title of the, uh, the chorus is, I will. No, 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 you gotta, it's a repeat aspect. I will, I will sing, of sing of your love, your love forever. forever. So when I get to the chorus aspect, if you want to, please sing along. We'll see if you're louder than El Salvador.
Good morning. I had to get that in quickly because it's going to be good afternoon, Jorley. <laughs> Don't worry. We'll go fast today. I'm not going to preach all of it. But you'll get the gist. What would you say is the king of the beasts? I knew that was coming. <laughs> what if you were to put a lion against the grizzly bear? Think about that. Grizzly bear, maybe 1,500 pounds against a lion. What makes the lion the king? Because normally they hunt in groups. And that gives them an advantage because they can come in so many different directions all at one time. And so it is, as we looked at our scripture reading this morning, your adversary, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking who he may devour. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Father, we're thankful for your word and the encouragement we find there. That although Satan is powerful, Jesus is more. May we continue to trust in him, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Would you believe it that lions are always hungry? It sometimes seems that way. But I think against a grizzly, probably he would be outnumbered, <laughs> no matter how hungry he was. And so it is... If we have Christ on our side, the lion that is so much our adversary is defeated. I want to start with a scripture in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verses 18 and 19. This is after the 70 had come back to Christ about how much they were able to do. And Jesus answers them. Luke chapter 10 and verse 18 he says, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Wow. That would be powerful, right? 
to have been given power by Christ to move forward, that nothing will be an effect on you. You will have power over all things. It doesn't matter what the devil throws at you. Nothing will harm you. The secret to this, or the catch line, so to speak, is found in the preceding verse, which I left out, verse 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject to us. Through your name. There's the catchphrase. Satan is seeking, what does it say? Those who he may devour. But he's not at freedom to just do what he wants. He has to have permission. Wow. Now, I don't think God would just turn him loose on you. I mean, we see that story in Job somewhat. But as a general rule, God just doesn't turn Satan loose to come get you. So where does he get the permission from? Exactly. He gets permission from you. When you're on a safari and you're traveling around all those lions, what keeps you safe? Staying inside the car. <laughs> Staying inside the, the bus, the van, the safari wagon, the truck, whatever it is. That is your security. And one of the reasons that happens is lions have perivision, which means they see the outline of the structure. They don't see the individuals within the vehicle. As a group, they only see one large, bigger than they object and are concerned not to attack because they know it's bigger than they are. If you were by yourself, get out of the safari vehicle to go take pictures. <laughs> you have now just reduced the size that they were seeing to be one person. And now they have opportunity. So the trick then is staying inside the car, staying inside the vehicle, staying together as a group. Because they see the mass, not the <laughs> portions of it. So how is it then that we can allow this to take place? Corinthians says, verse, 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, We need to understand how Satan works so that he cannot get the advantage over us. Okay? So what are some of the things that we need to do on our side of this picture to help us be vigilant. Our scripture reading this morning said, be sober. So insight number one is to be sober. What happens when you're unsober, unsober or drunk or just living on the wild side? You are in reality jeopardizing your own life. You're putting yourself at risk. You're like a zombie. Ever be like a zombie? Zombies just walk around in a stupor. They have no idea what's going on. So we're advocated in 1 Peter here to be sober, to be aware. That living the Christian life in the presence of the enemy is serious business and we need to be earnest, we need to be sincere, we need to be sober, we need to be aware and keeping ourselves under control. Not just uh, insight number two. Stay in the light. Cats are nocturnal. That's why they make such good mouse catchers. Mouses are no nocturnal as well. And so the cat's nocturnal and that makes free food, right? Sometimes <laughs> I wonder in our world if some of the people in it aren't nocturnal creatures. You never see them up before 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. And you never see them go to bed before 12, 1, 2 o'clock at night. I wonder if we're living in the wrong world. But we need to be aware. It's in the darkness that things happen. If you watch the news, 
morning news particularly, you'll see all the things that happened during the night. Stabbings, shootings, murders, uh, all kinds of things are happening at nighttime. Because that's when Satan works. You don't believe it? Look at John, thir uh, look at John 3. In John 3, verse 19, it says, Light has come into the world. Men of the world, could be women, love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Wow. Verse 20, for everyone that doeth evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds would be known, reproved, examined. You do it in the dark. But he, verse 21, that doeth truth comes to the light that his de deeds may be made manifest because they are from God. We need to be people of the light, headed to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus himself says, I am the light. So we need to stay in the light. We need to stay in Jesus. I mean, when you're out there camping in, on a safari and the fire goes out, that's when you need to be worried. I mean, you'd wake yourself up in the middle of the night just to stoke the fire. Duh. I mean, you know the lions are there. You can hear them breathing down your neck. But if you stay closer to the light, you're less apt to be lunch. Or would it be dinner since it's nighttime? Romans 13 verse 12 says, The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of what? Light. Light. Light is our armor, our protection. So we need to stay out of the dark and stay in the light. Insight number three. Stick together as Christians. As I mentioned, the lions are perivision. They don't see you as an individual free for attack, but they see you as a group. And so if we stay together, we are having the advantage over the roaring lion, Satan. Does that make sense? I mean, even in Hebrews, Paul says in Hebrews 10, 25, don't forsake the assembling together like some do. Especially, he said, as we see the day of coming. The day approaching is Jesus coming. And as we get closer to that, the exhortation is that we would stay together more frequently. Duh. You're safer in church. Together. Maybe you'd be safer if you'd come to prayer meeting more often. You're safer if you come to Sabbath school. Attend small groups. Have Bible studies. Get together for church socials. Some out outreach activities go as groups. When we're surrounded with other Christians, we have the advantage. It creates a safer environment for us because it keeps Satan at bay. We need to fellowship with one another. I find it interesting. Now this, this, this may be hazardous to my health. <laughs> Bob Sanjale said, I should be careful what I say, all right? When my words go out, it's too late. I can't put them back in the tube. When church is over, we should hang out and visit. It's interesting. When the sermon goes longer, which is today, people have a tendency to get up and leave. If I get done at 12, now that has happened in the past, not very often. It's amazing. It takes forever for the sanctuary to empty. People get together in different little groups and stand here and talk for 10 or 15 minutes. It's like, this is too early. We can't go yet. We need to stick together. We need to fellowship. It's not like the siren goes off when we all split. We need to take time to get to know each other, to get 
develop our friendships by fellowship because as we come together, we become a larger target, so to speak, for the roaring lion. Be careful as we go out into the world of life. We need to stay together. As he said, forsake not this assembling of coming together. Because, you know, there are hungry lions out there. There's TV lions, there's immoral lions, there's internet lions, there's spiritual predators in our modern world. They stalk our children, they lurk around our marriage. We're not safe to be alone. We need to join with Jesus and with one another. We need to put on that armor of light so that we can be seen and allow Jesus then to be our safety, our safe hold. Insight number four is resist. Just resist. James 4, 7. Remember that one? Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil. And he's going to what? Flee. Exactly. If we would put up a fight, if we would stand our ground, if we would strive to go against whatever it is that he was asking us to do, I mean, if we take one step toward him, he's going to take two toward us. <laughs> I mean, it goes pretty fast. And so it is, we need to be careful and be resistant. When the devil climbs over the fence, it's usually at the lowest point in the fence that he can cross the easiest. The point at which you are most vulnerable. That's where he'll get you. So the idea is not to lower the fence. And take note where those low places, those vulnerable places are, and bolster them up to get them higher. To don't allow him to climb over the fence. And worst yet, we don't want ourselves to be climbing over onto his side. Maybe it would come time to have an accountability partner. Someone to talk with and share with. Someone that will ask you maybe those hard questions. If you find that drugs or alcohol is your weakness, then do something about it. Fiddle with the door at the lion's den to keep it shut. Don't stop in the parking lot where that lure is there for you to come on in. Stay away. Resist. Number five. Ephesians says, put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And again, it goes through each of the elements of what that armor is, what we can put on. But the idea is we need it all. Not just one portion, but the whole thing. We need to arm ourselves with the Word. That is the most effective part that we have. To be armed. Yes, we are in a warfare. There's a song that goes like that, right? We are soldiers in the army. Okay? We are. This is a war that we're facing. I mean, you can look at the pictures on TV and see that Ukraine is having this war going on. And there's not a lot of place of safety. The same is true in our world, too. It's just the explosions, the damage looks different than the buildings do in Ukraine. It's us. It's people that are being destroyed. Our last insight, I want to go back to our first insight. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, be alert, be on guard. Spurgeon. A, a early proclaimer of the gospel said, if you are not seeking the Lord, then the devil is seeking you. Four times in the New Testament it says to be alert. Most of the lions in Africa wilds you see are sleeping or just walking around, slumbering, lumbering, because they're tired. They have been up all night hunting and running and feeding. If you don't stay alert, 
you will soon be dessert. Lion dessert. And I know you don't want that. Our adversary is awake 24 hours a day. I don't think he gets tired. He just keeps on and on. But fortunately if you're us, Jesus is awake 24 hours a day too. In fact, Jesus can be with you 24 hours a day. Can you imagine that if you are in Jesus, you're safe? Let's be in Christ because that is where the victory comes. Our faith is the victory, which is our closing hymn, 608. Faith is the victory. May we find it in Christ, 608. Please stand. Please stand. Faith is the victory. 608. Can we help you? Oh, you want to help? Yeah, that's great. Ready? Go. <laughs> In and can Father, we're thankful for the many blessings you pour out upon us, but mostly we're thankful for Jesus, our stronghold, our defense, our victory is faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Amen.